Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you on this beautiful Thursday morning to thank you for waking us each up this morning. Thank you for 
the privilege of being able to start a brand new day, start a new life, start new thoughts, and start new actions. Thank you for this lovely opportunity. And as we listen to the speaker today, Lord, clear our hearts and minds of anything that would be troubling us so that we can be filled with your Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. You have a unique message for each one of us, tailor-made, perfectly packaged for each one of us. Be with the speaker, put your words in his mouth, and may we be open to understand. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome to day four of our Week in Spiritual Emphasis. It's good to see you all. I just want to give you a few announcements and a few reminders. Um, immediately after our session this morning, those who would like to join the prayer band, if you have any special requests, um, silent, or if you want to share, please uh, come forward and we will spend um, a few moments in prayer. Also, if you would like um, to, to meet um, our preacher, uh, Pastor Ayas, um, if you, that he is availing himself for any counseling or anything that you want to talk about or pray about personally um, after the service in the chaplain's office, just behind reception. Um, that will be after the service, up until 12.30, and then also in the afternoon from 2.30 onwards to about 4 o'clock. So if you have any, uh, anything that you would like um, to talk about, to pray about, um, there are those, uh, those opportunities um, made available to you. Tomorrow we have in the evening, uh, 7.30 in the cafeteria, communion. We are remembering what Christ has done for us. Jesus paid it all, his shed blood. And so we'll be um, participating and partaking in the emblems, the bread which symbolizes his body and the grape juice which symbolizes his blood. And so all are welcome to come. Um, even if it may be your first time, you haven't experienced it before, we invite you to, to come and uh, it can be a learning experience also for you. There may be something that you are not used to. Uh, one of the, the practices that we, we also do is foot washing. Um, did you know that this was the example of Jesus? And uh, he asked his followers, his disciples, to, to follow in like manner. And so we invite you to come. And it's not just communion, but it is a, an agape feast. Um, it, we also uh, understand the importance of fellowship, communion not only with our Savior, but with one another. So 7.30 tomorrow evening. Well, uh, I'm so glad to have Pastor Ayas um, here. He shared with us a testimony yesterday evening. This evening, we are going to be meeting in Ann Vissa, uh, the girls' dormitory, the chapel there. And he is going to share his personal testimony, his experience, his encounter with Jesus, why he, uh, he made the decision to follow him. By the way, I was shocked. I said I would give you a little information about the preacher each day. So here it is. I was shocked to know um, about his experience. I thought he was, he was always a, a good guy. I can say that, right, preacher? Uh, he told me that uh, there were some windows broken in the primary school. We went and visited there. He was responsible for. Uh, he said that uh, um, Yvette Sparrow and, uh, and her late husband, Mr. Sparrow, who was a principal there, uh, he would give them headaches and nightmares um, because of who he was. But you know what he said? He also shared... He said that uh, he was able to, to see and to find Jesus here on this campus. And, um, and he speaks highly of the chaplain at that time, Prof. Eddie, who had opened his home and he felt welcome there. So we want to thank, I just want to take this time to thank our, our lecturers, our staff members for all that they do going above and beyond. They could be anywhere um, else, but they've chosen to be here. They, they have heard God's calling on their lives. We just want to appreciate you and to thank you. Um, for your service. 
we are going to sing together more about Jesus. And after more about Jesus, before we hear from God's word, we have a special item by our first year theology student, Selvan van Rensburg, who will be playing and singing as we prepare our hearts and our minds for the word. Let's stand together and sing more about Jesus. Before I want to sing, I feel it's important for me to pray first. So let's just quickly close our eyes. Thank you, God, for bringing us together in your house. I pray that you will make self disappear. Let your name be exalted through this item. Please touch our hearts. I pray this in your name only. Amen. nervous.
to sign your name. I read every word of it page by page. You said you'd be coming, coming for me soon. Oh my God, I'll be waiting for you. I wanna run on greener pastures. I wanna dance on higher hills. I wanna drink from sweeter waters in the misty morning chill. And my soul is getting restless for the place where I belong. I can wait to join the angels and sing my heaven song. I hear your voice and I catch my breath Well done my child, enter in and rest As tears of joy roll down my cheek It's beautiful beyond my wildest dreams I wanna run on greener pastures I wanna dance on higher hills I want to drink from sweeter waters in the misty morning chill. And my soul is getting restless for the place where I belong. I can't wait to join the angels and sing. Good morning. Praise God for that wonderful um, special item. Praise God for that. Anybody here this morning celebrating a birthday? Today. Okay, there's someone. Finally. Two. Could you please stand? Wow. Finally, finally, finally. So I just want to get name. What's your name? Babalua. Nanziwe. Okay. Let's pray for them. Father, we commit Nanziwe and Baba into your hands. We thank you for their life. We thank you for everything you do to keep them alive. Things we are not aware of, but we praise you for everything you do. And Father, on this special day, we ask that you bless them abundantly. Bless them spiritually, physically, emotionally, and provide financially. May it be a memorable day for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to come with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, and our key text is verse 12. Daniel chapter 3, verse 12. Where's my clicker? Okay, set. We will take off where we left off um, yesterday evening when I had shared my testimony. Now let's pray for the sermon. Let's pray. 
Father, may you please set me free from self. May you be seen and not me. Grant me your spirit and please do the same for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Satisfied against all odds is the title of our sermon. Satisfied against all odds. I'm going to read verse 13 and then we will delve into the chapter and reflect on this verse in light of the chapter. Verse 13 says the following. Daniel chapter 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 12, sorry, verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Satisfied against all odds. In this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. Now, it is not the first time that gold is mentioned in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, I wish we had time to study this wonderful book. King Nebuchadnezzar has a terrifying dream, and in this dream he sees a statue, and the head was made of gold. In that chapter, Daniel tells the king, you are the head of gold. It is your kingdom, 605 to 539. The reign of Nebuchadnezzar, otherwise Babylon is 626. But anyways, he told him, after you, another kingdom shall arise, and another kingdom, and another kingdom. Finally, the only kingdom that will remain forever is the kingdom of Jesus. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar discovered that his, reign, his sovereignty was given by God, but for a moment, to serve a certain purpose. But Nebuchadnezzar did not like the fact that his kingdom would come to an end. In the following chapter, he builds an image of gold. The Bible says whose height was 60 cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits, he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Babylon in scripture represents um, self-centered um, um, worship. It represents a kingdom that goes against God. It, it represents Satan. You see, we are in a great controversy. God has his city, Jerusalem. Satan has his city, Babylon. And this concept is built from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, where you have the fall of Babylon. But when you come back to the book of Genesis, you discover that they had built a tower in the plain of Dura, the tower of Babel. And Babel means confusion. Babel is different from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not a place of confusion, of syncretism and mixture. But here we have a, a, this image established in Babylon. And because of this image, the Bible says that the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, rulers of the provinces were all summoned to the dedication of this image. Everyone who was important in the kingdom was summoned. But not just everyone who held a high position or office in Babylon. Even all the people were also gathered for this worship, for the dedication of this image. In Daniel chapter 6, let's put chapter 3 aside. You find a similar narrative. The Bible says all the presidents, governors, princes, counselors, captains, whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man, for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the lion's den. Same context. In chapter 6, a decree was given that for 30 days, everyone should worship or pray to the king. Nobody else but to the king. And everyone, the Bible mentions, it is very similar to chapter 3. What we see in these two chapters is forced worship. Daniel is being forced to pray only to the king. In chapter 6, Daniel is alone. His three friends are not mentioned. In chapter 3, Daniel is not mentioned. But in both chapters, we find the context of peer pressure. 
we find a context of people being forced to do something against God's will. It is very clear. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. By virtue of God being the creator, sovereign, nobody should place anyone on the level that God is. And you see, idolatry, idolatry, simple definition of idolatry is allowing someone or anything to take the place of God in our lives. Giving attention that should be given to God to something else. That is idolatry. And so in these two chapters, we see God's people being forced to do something they should not do. Chapter 3, verse 4 says the following. To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. And the reason why this text is phrased like this is because Babylon at that time ruled the world. And so there were several people in Babylon because of the deportation that Babylon had done. They had invaded Israel and they had taken people from Israel to Babylon. But they had done this with Egypt prior to going into Babylon. There were Assyrians in Babylon. And Babylon at that time was the empire ruling the world. There was no empire more powerful than Babylon. And there were extra biblical um, chronicles that have been found that support all of this. And so it says, peoples, nations, and languages. Verse 5, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. All kinds of music. There's a mixture here. There's a Babel. There's a Babylon here. There's a mix. It's all kinds of music. Ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. I want you to notice the end goal over here. The end goal is to worship. But in order to get people to worship, they used what? Music. And all kinds of music. The end goal was worship, but music is being used to lead people to now, yesterday, in the testimony I shared, we spoke a little bit about music. Now, this technique that is being used over here continues today. You see, music has a powerful influence over us. You know, sometimes there are types of music. Although you don't want to move, you end up moving. And different type of music cause us to react in different ways. This is why there are music for every occasion. And so this is intentional, knowing the psychology of human beings. And, and, and look at the detail, all kinds of music. It was a mixture, no rule, no order. Remember yesterday I, I spoke to you about this satan, satanic priest. And there's something I did not highlight, and in the context of what we're discussing, I will highlight that. Anton van der Leve was an American author, a, a, a Satanist, but he was a musician. What was Satan before he, he fell? In heaven. He was the head of music. He was the, 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 the choir conductor. He led the choir. And when he came down, he came with those abilities. And he did not cast them aside. You see, Satan uses everything um, that, is, that is at his disposal. And so he uses music. And music has been used at times by Satan to lead us to do things that we ought not to do. And the same is happening in this context to lead people to do things they ought not to do. It's not only music. Let me read this statement. Read it yesterday, I'm going to repeat it for those who are not around, just for the sake of context. So Satan is actually interested in entertaining God's people. We've taken the element of music, and we are drifting a bit out of it, emphasizing this for a purpose. So he says the following, the TV set is the satanic family album. And yesterday I said there's nothing wrong with television, but there can be something wrong with what we watch. 
He says, this is a Satanist speaking, television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new Satanic religion. It should be brought out that we not only condone but encourage all types of what would be called sexual perversity and deviations because we feel that in a few short years it will be established that everyone is a sexual deviant and a pervert. You know that pedophilia is now considered a disease? So if, if you're a pedophile, it's not that... You just sick. It, it's, it's fine. It's like having a flu or a cough. I want to read something an inspired author wrote in Last Day Events, Chapter 6. She says this. Among the most dangerous resorts for pleasure is the theater. Instead of being a school of morality and virtue, as is so often claimed, it is the very hotbed of immorality. Vicious habits, sinful propensities, are strengthened and confirmed by these entertainments. Low songs, lewd gestures, expressions, and attitudes deprave the imagination and debase the morals. What are you listening to? What are you watching? Because ultimately these things, as they enter our mind, they shape our character and the way we act and conduct ourselves. Let me read something else. The desire for excitement and pleasing entertainment is a temptation and a snare to God's people. And especially to the, especially to the young. Satan is constantly preparing inducements to attract minds from the solemn work of preparation for scenes just in the future. Through the agency of worldlings, he keeps up a continual excitement to induce the unwary to join in worldly pleasures. There are shows, lectures, and an endless variety of entertainments that are calculated, calculated, designed, framed, elaborated, prepared, the music, Everything to lead to a love of the world. And through this union with the world, faith is what? Faith is weaker. How do you explain? You know, when, when we often watch something, we, we sometimes can watch for two hours, series. Three hours, four hours. But reading the Bible, like what? just one minute, is a fight. To pray is a fight. You invite someone to go to the movies, there's excitement. Let's go for Bible study. It's like I'm inviting you to go kill someone. You will rarely find people who go to the theater and like they knock out the sleep, gone, but you find that in church. We are eager to go and indulge in worldly things. But we, when we are in worship, we cannot wait for the sermon to end. We, we cannot. There's an excitement we have for those things and no excitement for God. See, this thing is not normal. I know people who spend the whole night watching series and movies. The whole night. Just invite them for prayer marathon. Just, just do it. You see, there's something in there that attracts us. Is that it was designed and calculated to do that. I'll ask again. What are you listening to? What are you watching? Let me read two other. Let me read a text. Psalms 101 verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Why? Because it's going to influence me. Let me read another quotation. Every youth, not some, every, every youth, every youth who habitually attends such exhibitions will be, not might, will be, will be corrupted in principle. There is no influence in our land more powerful. Now this gets worse because now we're actually talking about the most powerful influence to do what? To poison the imagination let me give you an example have you ever picked up a bible and as you're reading the bible you get thoughts that have nothing to do with the bible 
Maybe that doesn't happen to you guys. It has happened to me because I used to watch a lot of garbage. A lot of garbage. You're praying. You're speaking to the Lord in the presence of God. Some thought pops up of something you saw way, way back in the past. There's nothing more powerful to poison the imagination. And look what it does. To destroy religious impressions. And to blunt the relish for the tranquil pleasures and sober realities of life than theoretical amusement. The love for these themes, for these themes, increases with every indulgence as the desire for intoxicating drink strengthens with its use. Last quotation. The blessing of God would not be invoked upon the hours spent at the theater or in the dance. Now let me say this. The theater in itself is not bad. It just depends what you do there. No Christian would wish to meet death in such a place. It means if you die, now this is heavy, if you die in a place where things are seen and heard that are not in accordance to God's will, there's no heaven. It's over. To die in a place like that, it's done. No one would wish to be found there when Christ shall come. Oh, and if, you don't, if we don't die there, Jesus comes and finds me there, it's over. Now, we may not go to those places, but if I have the things that are seen and done in those places with me on my phone or my laptop, Jesus comes or I die, the same can be applied. The only safe amusements are such as will not banish serious and religious thoughts. The only safe place of resort are those with which we can take Jesus with, with us. Anything we do of which we cannot take Jesus with us, that we cannot invite Jesus, we, then we shouldn't do it, we shouldn't go, regardless of who else is doing it. Regardless of who else is doing it, we should not, because it is not safe. Let's get back to Daniel chapter 3. So these young men were before a statue. They were being pressured. Music was being used. The image was set up, and the music was there to sort of make them decide. Many people bowed down that day. And these young men, by the way, they were not the only Jews in Babylon. According to Babylonian Chronicles, King Nebuchadnezzar took a lot of people to Babylon from Jerusalem. The Bible says, There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, these three, these three, O king, have no, not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. These men refuse. And the Bible, there's a word I highlighted in green. They have no regard. Chapter 6. Remember Daniel? He was forced to pray only to the king. Well, Daniel did as usual. He went into his room, left his window open, he used to pray publicly, I mean, with his window open. He wasn't going to close it just because there's a decree. He wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't shy to pray to his God. Kept his window open as it usually was, knowing that they were trying to find him praying so that they could report. He didn't close his window, knelt down and prayed. And then they also saw him, and people came and said, Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. He had the habit of praying three times a day. And even though there was a decree, he was threatened with death. You know, some people would say, brother, at least just close your window. Just close your window. You still pray. Isn't that the most important that you talk to God in your heart? Isn't it the most important? 
and you pray, no one will see you, no one can accuse you, and even if they accuse you, you can say, did you see me? Daniel said, no. I'm not, I'm not following God in, in secret, even in public. He left his window open, and they saw him praying. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 13 says, that Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury, he was angry. And let me tell you, you don't want to get on the bad side of Nebuchadnezzar. There's a document narrating in the 4th century, there was a revolt in Babylon. And during the revolt, Nebuchadnezzar, there, there were people in his army that had led that revolt. And Nebuchadnezzar was so disappointed and angry that he not only ordered for the execution of those men, but he participated in annihilating them. Nebuchadnezzar was the type of king who would not stay behind during battle. He would go out in front. This was a man who was a warrior. He was a fighter. And he was known for being someone who responded with fury. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury said this, said this, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, I will give you an opportunity to bow down. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And now this is where he gets himself into trouble. I mean into worse. Because he says, he adds the following. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? You see, anytime someone is connected with God and you challenge them, you're not just challenging them, you're challenging their God. Because God promised, I will never leave you, no? Forsake you. And so when you attack someone that has committed their lives to God, you are attacking God. God made a promise. He's not about to break a promise. I heard what has happened. Now listen, we're going to play the music again. And we're going to give you another chance. I think he did this because these guys were valuable to his kingdom. He recognized their value. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar. And then she said, this person is of a different faith. I, I, I like to follow the Bible. Some of you may have your own opinion. I just like to stick to the Bible. All right? And I told her, are you sure? You know what the Bible says, right? Don't be unequally yoked. It doesn't say there are contexts where you can be unequally yoked. It's not a suggestion. It's, it's a command. Do not be unequally yoked. And so she said, I want to do this, and I want you to pray for me. I'm, I'm not praying for you. You want to get me into trouble with God. So God has said, do not. You want me to pray. What do you want me to ask God to do? To change his word? You want me to, I'm not praying. I'm not doing that. Now, God gives the freedom of choice. If you want to do that, you can go. But just know that there are consequences. One of them is this. In the context of sin, theologically, Marriage is the union of two miserable people. It's the union of two sinful people. Hmm? People who have issues, who have problems, and who need Christ constantly, and even with Christ, commit mistakes and are not perfect. So marriage in itself, even with Christ, is a complex situation. But it, it, with Christ, it, it, it ends up being good. But it's a complex situation. Now you want to go f add further problem to a situation that is already complex. You are making marriage impossible. As it is intended to be. Now that's fine if you want to go there. But I'm not praying for that. I'm not doing that. These young men said, hey, listen, we don't need time to think. We know what is right. 
We have to do what is right. We don't need you to play the music again. We don't need you to do anything. We won't do it. And then you get to verse 17. They say this. If it be so, if it be so, this is now conditional. This is a conditional clause. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. We have faith that God can save us from this fire. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. He has the power to do it. We have the faith to believe that he can do it. So we are going to stand firm and trust our God. But if not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What they did over here is, is something. They said, listen, king, you see, this fire that you have heated up, if you throw us in there, the God we serve is able to save us. He has the power to save us. We don't doubt it. He's sovereign. He can deliver us. And we believe that he can. But let me tell you something else. We also believe that he can let us die in the fire. And whether he saves us or allows us to die, we're okay with it. The reason why we want to tell you this, king, we don't want you to get it twisted. You may think that if we die in there, our God was not able to deliver us. No. If just in case we die in there, don't think that he, is not, he was not able to. He is. We're just content on accepting anything that he allows. You see, we're so satisfied with him. That we don't really care what you do to us as long as we die faithfully to him. We just want to know what's his will. That's it. And we follow it. The consequences is not our business. We just follow him. We just do what he asks us to do. It's that simple. Whatever happens, happens. And before you throw us in there, be it known unto thee that if we die, it's not because he didn't have the power. Now the king heard this and said, man, these kids, these kids are disrespectful. And you know what he does? The Bible says, or oh, let me read a quotation. The enemy of our souls is no ordinary foe. He was once one of the highest intelligences in the heavenly universe. And since his fall from heaven, he has had long experience in dealing with human minds. And in manipulating them in accordance with his will. That's why I spoke about music. That's why they were using music. And that's how the devil is still using music and entertainment. And a whole lot of other things. But I highlighted music and all these entertainment in light of the context of all kinds of music used to lead people to worship. She goes on to say, we can be saved from his snares only by beholding and imitating the life of Christ. This is our only hope. We must die to the world and to sin. And what? And what? And be baptized. Then we shall have the privilege of walking in newness of life. You see, this is the bottom line of it all. You see, Jesus doesn't just want to protect people. He wants to save people. Daniel 3, 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. It's interesting that they tied them up. I mean, you're going to throw someone in the fire, but you tie them up. They threw them in the fire, bound. I want to emphasize something here, that it's not about who's against you, but who's with you. You know why they only threw these three young men? Because all the others bowed down. All the other young men bowed down. And let me tell you something. There were other people older than these young men who bowed down. And I like this image because it depicts someone telling them, hey, listen, just today, man. I mean, just bow down today. It's okay. Just do it today. But these guys understood that you don't follow the multitude. You follow God. Something else. God isn't looking for an army. He's looking for willingness. He's looking for willingness. 
The small group in the hands of God is an? Just three, just three. They defied the order of the king. So as they were in the fire, the Bible says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste and said the following, Did not cast three men? They answered, True, O king, we did. When you go to Daniel chapter 6, verse 19, the Bible says, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the lion's den. Notice that both kings in both chapters go in haste. One in the fire, the other in the lion's den. Both kings, different kings, different years. They go in haste to see what has happened to these men. Chapter 3, verse 25, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men, and they are what? They are loose. The previous text told us that they were bound, correct? Now they are loose. The only thing that burned were the ropes. And the Bible says, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Why not just stand in the fire? Why do you have to walk in the fire? They were trying to send a message to those who were outside. They were saying, we're okay over here. We're fine. It's comfortable being here. And so they were walking in the fire as though they were not in the fire. And the Bible says that the king said the fourth is like the son of. They went in three, but somebody joined them. Why does he say the fourth looks like the son of God? Maybe connected to the dream we had in chapter two where at the end he sees the kingdom of Christ. So Jesus joined these guys in the fire. Chapter 22, the Bible says, Daniel responds, my God hath sent his angel. In chapter 3, a fourth person did what? Joined them. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no what? No hurt. Now it's interesting. There's a there's a, there's a lesson here which is very important. What is that lesson? You see, God could have prevented Daniel and his friends from being caught. He could have prevented them from being bound, but he didn't. He could have prevented the men who lifted them up, but he didn't. He could have prevented them from being thrown into the uh, fire, but he didn't. Instead of preventing the difficulty, the problem... He joined them and made them stronger. Now, this is important because God doesn't always remove difficulties and challenges. He will just give you strength to bear them. He won't remove it. The same with Daniel. He could have prevented them from throwing him in the lion's den. Or, as he is in the lion's den, he could have killed the lions. Just kill the lions. He says, no, I'm going to keep the lions alive. I'm going to keep Daniel alive. In the lion's den. I'm just going to join them. That's how God sometimes delivers. You see, standing for Christ doesn't depend on location. Whether it's in the fire, whether it's in the lion's den, whether it's before a statue, regardless of the pressure, when we are in Christ, we can stand. Standing for Christ doesn't depend on numbers. Daniel was alone in chapter 6. And these three young men stood when everybody else was bowing down. God will not prevent us from being thrown into the dens. He will, he will let the trials come. He will let the difficulties come. He will let the burdens come. He will let the financial crisis come. He will let the family crisis come. He will let relationship crisis come. What will he do? Let me read this text. Verse 22 of chapter 6 says, My God sent his angel." And shut the lion's mouths that they did not harm me. God will not prevent us from being thrown in the den. Because he wants to keep us safe in the den. Instead of removing trials, he gives guidance through trials. Instead of removing all burdens, he gives strength to bear burdens. Instead of removing all difficulties, he gives wisdom to solve them. Instead of removing crisis, he gives provision to outlive the crisis. Jesus to end family crisis and Christ's likeness to end relationship crisis. A life without Jesus in the world that we face, 
a life without, prob- without Jesus Christ, living in this world without being satisfied in Jesus is a life like this. It's a miserable life. Challenges will always be there. But if you have Jesus, it makes all the difference. All the difference. The, the, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is presented as Jesus Christ. He appears several times. I'm going to read this quotation which says, He suffers in the person of the saint, and whoever touches his chosen ones, touches, touches him. You see, because they were so satisfied with Jesus, they could stand against all odds. God did not keep Daniel from the lion's den. God could have removed the lions. God could have prevented Daniel from being thrown into the lion's den, but instead he joined them. And out of this, there's a lesson that we need to take. We need to stop. We need to stop. What do we need to stop? And besides stopping, we need to start. We need to stop asking God to remove problems or temptations. And we need to start asking God to prepare us to deal or to face them. You see, when you think God will remove everything, you're not prepared for what will come. Not everything is to be removed. I want to end with the appeal I made yesterday. The reason why these men, chapter 3 and chapter 6, could stand firm against everything, and they were satisfied against all odds, given options to worship someone else, the reason why they could not do it was because of the salvation they enjoyed. And the satisfaction that they found from that relationship. That they craved no other God because they were satisfied with the God that they had. And that is why they could deny what was being offered. There's a verse in Isaiah 43, 2, which says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle up upon thee. You know, the Israelites walked through the Red Sea. And the Red Sea, according to Corinthians, Paul says it is a metaphor for baptism. You see, Israel, Egypt represented slavery to sin. Moses is a type for Jesus. And as he takes them through the Red Sea, that's a baptism as they enter into the promised land. And you know, just before they entered the promised land, they had to go through another river, the the Jordan Through the fire, he's with us. In the lion's den, he's with us. When Jesus came to die for us, Jesus felt the burden of our sins and said, Father, if it be thy will, do what? Remove this cup from me. It was hard. He was feeling all the weight of our sins. It was so hard. He said, if it be your will, remove this cup. Or remove this cup, but if it be your will, let it be. But and then you know what happens? Instead of God sending an angel to take Jesus out of the world, he sends an angel, according to Luke 22, 43, the Bible says an angel appealed unto him and did what? Strengthen him. Not to remove him from the difficulty, but to strengthen him to do what? To endure what he was going through. I want to end with the appeal I made yesterday. That appeal is for any person who is here who would love to have this type of satisfaction in God. As I said, God is not just interested in protecting people. He's interested primarily in saving people. That's his primary goal. Because the world will pass He's going to come again, and there will be eternity. Because, you know, when you are saved, Jesus may at times let the righteous die, and he's not worried about it. Psalm says that the death of the righteous is sweet to him. He's not concerned because he resurrects the dead. And so the ultimate thing, the foundation, the way to be satisfied with Jesus is to have him as personal savior. That's how we can be satisfied with Jesus. These three men 
stood for God. And when they were thrown in the fire, God also stood for them and with them because they had stood with him. And they had to do it publicly. You see, today people have a challenge of demonstrating publicly that they accept Christ. There may be somebody here who would love to do that. You see, when we accept Christ publicly, we're not saying we're the most perfect. Jesus doesn't call the perfect. The perfect don't need him. He came for the lost like me. He came for those that need him like me. Not for the perfect. And so when we stand, we're saying, Lord, I understand. I need help. Everybody actually needs help. But some are too shy to be saved. Anybody here this morning that would love to say, Lord, I want to accept you. Maybe it's Bible studies you you can have those Bible studies. Maybe you've already had Bible studies. But you want to accept Jesus as personal Savior. I want to offer a special prayer for you. And there are also people who are already baptized. And they would like to rededicate their lives to Jesus. I also want to pray for you. I'm going to ask Pastor B to come up front. I want Pastor B to stand over here. All those who are saying, Lord, I want to accept you as personal Savior. I want you to stand on that side. I'm going to have him pray for you. I'm going to pray for those who are saying, Lord, I want to rededicate. Rededicate, I want you to come to me. If you're coming for baptism or Bible study, I want you to go to him. If you are coming to rededicate yourself to the Lord, I want you to come this side. I just want to make sure I give enough time because I know what happens in contexts like this. I just want to make sure I give enough time. But if you would love to rededicate yourself to the Lord, I want you to come this side. I'm already standing here on the first. You need Bible study. You need baptism. You ought to be going that side. Every time we have the chance to accept Christ, we should take advantage. We should take advantage. Nobody knows what tomorrow holds. And every time we have this opportunity, this golden opportunity, we should take advantage of If you're still seated, you can still come. There is still time. I know we have class. Class is very important. But salvation is at stake. Salvation is on the line. And so you know you need to be here. You better come up here. Can I pray? I'll pray, and then you pray, Pastor. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for life. We thank you for your word. Lord, please have mercy upon us. Those of us who know your word have known it, have gone into the waters of baptism. But oftentimes, we do not stand for you. Lord, help us. Grant us your Holy Spirit. Those of us standing here on the left, Father, we dedicate our lives to you. We ask that you may continue to mold us and that you may use us for your glory and for your honor. Revive the desire to spend time with you and to reflect your character. May we have an impact leading people to Christ. And in the process, may we grow in Christ. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The word is clear. That there is rejoicing in heaven over one lost sinner who has returned home to the Father. And so today we join heaven. Our hearts are glad and are full. We are satisfied with Jesus. 
We thank you for these children, your children, who have made this decision, this momentous decision, the best decision that they can ever make to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and their Savior. And so I pray, Lord, now that you would seal this commitment with the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that Jesus paid it all. And so in response to his love, in response to his sacrifice, we, Father God, accept him into our hearts. And so now, Father God, we look forward to, to what will happen now, what will take place as Jesus lives out his life within us. I pray, Lord, that you would protect them from the snares of the enemy, that you would be with them as they continue, as they start this journey with you, Bible study but also going into baptism. Thank you, Father God, that it's not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. We thank you for the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. We thank you for the lamb who takes away our sin. And we thank you that there is still wonder-working power in the blood of the lamb. So now, Father God, Bless these, your sons and your daughters. And for those who, who have made a decision where they are, we want to pray also for them, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you continue to work in their lives. You know what each one is going through. But we thank you for the reminder from your word today that you, if you take us to it, you can bring us through it. Thank you that you are with us. And we thank you, Father God for that time where we will be with you for all eternity. There will be no more problems, no more challenges, no more separation. But until that day, may we be faithful to you. We cannot do it in and of ourselves. We need you, Jesus. So continue to work in us. May we continue to submit and surrender. May we, in this hall, all experience your presence as we go and journey through this day, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. St uh, is playing, we will leave. Remember, there is time in the, the chaplain's office if you want special prayer. Um, it will happen this morning, this afternoon as well. We'll be in Anvisa this evening at 7 o'clock. And for those who would like to pray in our prayer band, you are most welcome. God bless you as you make your way to your next class.